Hello again, here's another one of these Navono Tiny PCs. This is the M900. It is a Skylake machine, so Intel based. This one came with the Intel i5, so I'm not going to be doing an upgrade on the CPU today. This machine itself cost me 150 so it was a pretty good deal. It came with 8GB of RAM and 500GB standard hard drive. I tried using it in that setup and the CPU wise it was fine but the hard drive was very 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 slow so trying to run even older games and various things you would get uh, lockups where it would just hang and you could hear the hard drive crunching away and then it would just just into life. Loading software was incredibly slow it was all just really bad and we win Windows 10 running behind it it seems to be Windows 10 was using pretty much all the hard drive all the time, so it was completely unusable. So, I'm going to upgrade this to an SSD. So we can take an M2, I'm not entirely sure what the configuration. On another one I looked at, is on the back of the board, we'll have a look. As always, there's one screw on the back, which will be taken out. And the top just pops off. Pretty standard configuration with these, when it contains a proper socketed CPU. We've got the heatsink and fan here, and the hard drive here. A little dust in here, but nothing too bad. Interestingly, this time, we seem to have a thumb screw here, so that should just... Now, in terms of upgrades, this machine should be able to take 16 gig of RAM, no problem, with a max of 32 gig. I'm going to be installing 16 gig into here. Currently, there's only eight. As you can see, we're not quite from that view, let me move the camera a bit. We have a empty slot for Wi-Fi, M.2 slot. And down here, slightly hidden. Let me try and position it in the light. We have another M.2 slot, which can be configured in two lens products things. And it has one of these plunger things for locking it into place. So that's nice to see. It can run SATA M.2 drives and NVMe, so that's quite nice. We're going to be installing just the cheap Maxter SSD. Nothing too special. 240 gig. So pretty standard stuff. And that's the only upgrade I'm going to be doing apart from the RAM. And while I'm here I'm going to take all this apart and give it a clean up. Hopefully to extend the life of this machine. As you can probably see there is a couple of screws here. One there, one there, one there. And there appears to be two down here as well. So let's take these three out and see if that's enough to release the fan. Not quite long screws, but it just pops out nice and easy. It would appear that the fan connector is underneath this VGA connector, which is a bit of a pain. It should just slot out and I won't remove it, I'll put that back in anyway. And fan connector is just down here. Let's give it a little gentle wiggle. Don't pull on the cables if you can avoid it. it looks pretty good. I'm not even going to bother cleaning that. That was clean enough anyway. Down here we have chipset, a little bit of dust but the fan itself, I put some air down there and that will clear that out. CPU socket here as with other models and it should be just four screws here, here and here. Now we'll quickly pop the speaker out and it should just simply a bit a bit of wiggle come out no problem there we go so pretty standard affair a bit of copper heat pipe down to a vent and just a blower fan so pretty standard stuff and we have here a standard cpu socket for the skylight chips it can't take any cabby lake so the fastest CPU you can install in this machine is a 6700T. You can modify the BIOS 
and it can take Kaby Lake CPUs then. So realistically, you're limited to a 6700T. Let's pop this out. I mean, on power consumption, with the hard drive in there, it was pulling 15 watts at idle, and at full load, it was pulling 34.8. With the SSD, it's pulling 9.1 at idle and 29.1 at full load, so quite a big drop. Pop the RAM out. What came installed in here was some Samsung DDR4. Pretty standard stuff, running it. 2133, which is what this machine can take maximum because of Skylake. So let's give this all a clean and put it all back together then, shall we? So, yeah, one cleaned up i5 6400T running at 2.2 gigahertz. It's a very good CPU. I've used these in the past, though obviously not as good as, let's say, the i7. So, let's pop this all back in, give it a clean up. And then just pretty much all back in reverse. So slot that back on like that. Make sure it's nice and firmly in. And screw the heat plate back down. Then pop the van back on. Just so slot back in place. Plug the fan connector back in down here. Can be a little fiddly, but in he goes. Pop the speaker back in. Like so. Then pop the VGA connector back in. Next, let's drop the RAM in. And as stated, of course, you could install an M.2 drive, which would just drop into there like so. Drop down and you would fasten it in place with this plastic clip here. But I'm not going to be doing that today. As stated, I'm going to use this Maxter drive, which at this point just slots straight back in like so. And thumb screw back into its rightful place, like so. And there we are, all reassembled. Granted, only a quick RAM upgrade and change to an SSD, but hopefully that should give us a nice performance boost. So let's go plug it in, have a look at some benchmarks, some software and some games, and just see how well it performs then, shall we? First, let's look at the hard drive performance. With the hard drive originally, it was only about 95 meg. Putting the SSD in, it goes up to 470, so a massive improvement. With CPU Z, as you can see, we're scoring about 314 in single thread, and 1138 in multi-thread not as fast as big brother but it's not bad at all in 7-zip here we're getting about 14,000 mips this is about running for about a minute so that's not bad at all that's pretty reasonable performance for this cpu so it kind of gives you an idea how much grunt this cpu has been doing tasks like unzipping in cinebench r23 this is the latest cinebench we score a score of, of 2,234, so that's not bad at all. That's a pretty reasonable score. And looking at Handbrake, we've encoding a 4K video, it doesn't do that well. It only averages about one and a half frames a second, and it takes 1,200 seconds to complete this particular render. Looking at PC Mark, this is general performance for the machine. So productivity-wise, absolutely fine. It's a good enough machine for a general day-to-day -day use. Moving on to some graphical stuff then, this is using the HD 530, which isn't a great card, 
but in 3D Mark in Time Spy we're scoring 384, which is faster than the GT710. In Fire Strike it scores exactly the same at 927. In Night Raid we score a little bit more at 4567, and in Wildlife we score 2426. So slightly faster than the GT710 overall, which isn't a massive shock because that card's awful. So you know, just goes to show you don't always have to pair this particular iGPU with a graphics card. Looking at Alien Isolation, this of course didn't run at all with the hard drive. As you can see, nice and smooth in terms of loading now, so that problem's been solved. We're getting an average around about 30 FPS, so not great, and it's everything on low. So it's playable, but not a great experience. But looking at some other cards, once again, it beats the GT710, no problem at all. But iGPUs from this AMD just wiped the floor of it, which isn't a shock. And something like a GT1030 would be far better. Now looking at a different type of game, this is Final Fantasy XIV. It's an MMO. It doesn't perform very well at all, even on the lowest setting. You could probably knock the resolution down and get it to a playable state, but I wouldn't recommend it. The GT710 here beats this internal GPU in this particular instance. That's only because it was paired with a very fast CPU when I did that test. But overall, I wouldn't waste your time trying to run a game like this. It might be able to play something like World of Warcraft, but certainly not Final Fantasy XIV. Because someone's going to ask, can it win Fortnite? Well, here it is on low with a 30 FPS cap running at 1080p using DirectX 11. And okay, we're getting 30 FPS, getting an average of about 29. We do get dips into the high teens, and occasionally it does stutter here and there, so not ideal. CPU is pretty much not getting that stressed, and the GPU is, well, the bottleneck here, hitting about 80% at times, but just about playable, I would say. But let's look on the same game using the performance API, this time 60 FPS cap, everything on low again. As you can see, we're running about 60 FPS with an average of about 58-ish. It does dip into the high 20s on occasion, so it get little stutters. Not as bad as what it was before. The CPU is, you know, okay here, and the GPU is once again the bottleneck, but more playable with this API. Of course, it's slightly buggy in places, but it certainly gives a better experience than the standard API. Here is Doom 3. It doesn't run very well on this iGPU and CPU on the maximum settings. Not a massive shock, Doom 3 is a bit of a pain to run. You could knock the resolution down or turn off some of the settings, anti aliasing and that kind of thing, and it probably would be playable. But as you can see, don't always assume that you can play old games on the maximum settings on this, so just goes to show that you can't play everything. Now here's Half-Life 2. It runs much better. This once again, an older game. All the settings are pretty much on high and we're getting an average around 127, 128, so much more playable, stupid frame rates, put a 60 FPS cap on this, maybe up the resolution if you can, and more than playable, so if you want to play older titles on a machine like this, go ahead, it's perfectly capable of doing it. Just watch some games like Doom 3, which is always a bit of a pain to run. Well in conclusion, there's not much more I can really say. The CPU performance is pretty decent, for a 35 watt CPU. You can upgrade to an i7 if you wish. You can take M.2 drives, which is absolutely brilliant. And the game performance is what you'd expect from Intel integrated graphics. Perfectly great for older titles. And some newer titles like Fortnite can be played on low settings. So it's okay. Just don't expect amazing performance. Obviously upgradability, you max out at 32 gig of RAM. So for the foreseeable future, that's pretty much okay. Obviously no ability to upgrade graphics. It shouldn't really matter for a machine like this because it's designed to be a small footprint and low power consumption. I mean, it only draws about 30 watts at full load, so that's absolutely brilliant. If you're looking for a low power machine that can do a bit of light gaming, certainly pick one of these up. They're an absolute bargain if you shop around between about 150 and 200. The i3 version should be a little lower than that, and just go ahead, just remember to swap out that hard drive for an SSD if it comes with a standard hard drive and you're absolutely golden. So I hope that was helpful or at least informative for some people. And I've got a few more of these machines lined up, so stay tuned. But leave any comments and questions below. But until next time, goodbye.